Okay. Technology is not my thing, you know? <laughs> okay, so about I uh, I was a schmooze, a vod, just some thoughts that I wanted to share with the Hebra. Um, also, I'll be the first to admit a slight amount of bait and switch. Uh, I'm not technically connecting COVID-19 to the Seder. I'm actually doing a little more. I'm going to try and connect it to Kalatora Kula. Let's see, let's see if we can do that. What do you want? Sorry, Wilson. Yeah, so I both say, in, in my humble opinion, and I think the Bali Muster basically talk about this quite obviously, Bisral. Now, the greatest distance in the universe is the distance between our head and our heart. I think personally, the malacha, again, probably call it Torah Kula, and certainly of every yantif, is to take whatever is the message of that yantif, and you have to do the research, you have to find out what are we supposed to be focused on, the Gabi, any given yantif, and make it real. Kala Torah Kula is all about taking the things we know and we understand and making them real. How hard is it to make something real? How far can we go in the efforts to make something real? So let's go back to the very first Seder in the history of Klal Yisrael. The Rabag says in Parshas Bo, that the Rabbi is going on the Pasuk, which says that they were Mitzvah, they were commanded um, in Mitzrayim to eat the original carbon Pesach, the very first carbon Pesach. With the first Seder in the history of Klal Yisrael, they were commanded to eat it with their um, belts tied up, their, their, their shoes on their feet, feet, their sticks in their hand, and eat it very quickly. There's a lengthy rabag here. Normally they would unbuckle their belts, they would relax. He says that's still the minute in many places. They would take their shoes off, they would wash up. Brings a riot from Avma Minu. And a person didn't normally carry his stick when he was eating. That was something for the road. He commanded them to eat the carb Pesach, but there was no sin. Like people who are rushing to go on the road. To show them. This time, Paro will send them without a doubt. That in this way, it'll add to their amuna when they'll see that Hashem is keeping their promise. The whole purpose here was to take them away from their rotten nifsados amunas, the things they picked up in Mitzrayim, and take them to Amuno Hamitis. Because this is a open Asholim Lam Latzoha Anushis. And they said that's why it's only for this particular Pesach that they had this Tsivoy. Well, so just to paint the picture, I think we all imagine somehow, maybe from when we were little kids, we all imagine that, you know, they ate the carbon Pesach all dressed up and ready to go. Because as soon as they were finished eating, they ran right out of Mitzrayim. That's not true. That's not the Mitzrayim at all. The fact was, I assume he did the carbon Pesach, like every carbon Pesach, the Doros, maybe they didn't have the Durabonim, but they had to eat it by Chatzos, Stamo. Certainly, according to the laws, I think he yelled at the Halach, they had to eat it by Chatzos. And they didn't go out at night. Fakir, Chazal say, they went out Dafka by day, but Etzim Ayom Paro said in the middle of the night to Moshe, go, go, get out. And Moshe said, no, we're not leaving like thieves who leave out in the middle of the night. We're waiting until tomorrow morning, and then we're going to go. So just picture the average Jew, the average Yehudi, what's he do? He puts on all of his 
traveling garments. He's got his belt girded, his shoes are on, his mackle in his hand, and he gobbles down the carbon Pesach quickly. And then what does he do when he's done, Mistama? I don't know. Takes off his garments, puts on his pajamas, goes to sleep, wakes up in the morning, and he leaves. And maybe they spent the night packing. I don't know. I, mean, I can't say for sure. But it was not that they were dressed up because you're about to go. They were dressed up. Why? This time you really leave it. It was a Musr Seder of Osai. It was a Chinuch HaMusr. It was, this time, get dressed up. This time you're travelers. We're really going now. They have to, they have to put on a costume. Well, say, these were people who had seen nine of ten Makos. Okay, you have to say, I hadn't yet seen the tenth Mako. That was midnight at that night when Ein Bayas or Ein Shameis. They saw all ten Makos. Not one word that Moshe Rabbeinu told them didn't come true. They were told Paro would harden his heart. They all knew. Because Rabbeinu told Moshe Rabbeinu, yeah, you're going to ask him, but it's not going to happen until after 10 Makos. It was not as though they had any great reason to believe it wasn't going to happen. And they had seen such awesome, awesome miracles showing that. I mean, go back to the very first step. Moshe Rabbeinu shows Pakot Pakati. Oh, he said that. He said he knew the term. This is the term of Geula. Mashiach is here. That's it. We're going out. A year already, they aren't working. Chazal say, as soon as the Mako started, it was the end of Malachi, it was the end of the work. It's not bad. After 86 years of slavery, it's over. Okay, we're still in Mitzrayim. But we're not working anymore. It's been a year of not working anymore. And you saw miracles beyond belief. Do you think we're leaving? Yeah, Moshe Ben said we're leaving. Of course we're leaving. You know what? Put on the clothing. Dress as if you're leaving. Lahoyerosa. It'll drive it home. It'll make you feel it more. It'll make it more real. Because that's what both said. That's Kalato Rakula. That's the Ikra Malacha, is to tr- take the things that we know. Of course they knew they were leaving. Of course they had no doubts. Of course they had seen miracles. These are great people. But Lamai said, take what you can, do what you can to make it more real, to drive it home, to make it part of you emotionally. Be maybe even a bigger seer. Go back to even before. The Pesach story, the beginnings of the Pesach story. It's a Rashi. Moshe Rabbeinu was standing at the snare, the very difficult Pasuk there. Get out of Chumash. The Pasuk says, This for you should be the sign that I am sending you. A very difficult thing has it with the end of the Pasuk. What is the sign? So one of Rashi's Pshatim. You're going to be successful and I'm going to save you. Just like you see, this snare is burning and doesn't get consumed, so too you will go on my shlichus and not be harmed. And not be harmed on my shlichus. Of Osai. Do you think Moshe Rabbeinu, who has at this point already reached the level of Nevuah, and the Kaddish Baruch B'chvod of Yatzma is revealing himself to Moshe Rabbeinu at possibly one of the highest levels, the highest possible levels, he's revealing himself to Moshe. But Yare Moshe may habit el Elohim. Moshe was afraid to look. He's revealing himself. And he's saying, this is it. There's a haftacha. I promised I'm going to take them out. And I'm sending you to do it. Now, admittedly, a dangerous thing. A dangerous thing. But does Moshe Rabbeinu believe? Is he accepting? Is he a Baal Is he a Baal Muna? Does he know? Of course he knows. So what's with the parlor trick? And let me show you something, Moshe Rabbeinu. Let me show you. See that? I have a snare, and it's burning, but it's not being consumed. So to you, you'll be the same thing. Nice thing, but Abish doesn't do miracles for nothing. Is that really necessary? 
Is Moshe Rabbeinu not going to go otherwise? Of course he's going to go, and of course he's going to believe. But Lamai Sarbosai, it's Kedai to do a miracle for nothing more than what's fundamentally a Musr Seder for Moshe Rabbeinu. Deherit. See? Look, see with your own eyes. See it, feel it, experience it, know it. You see, it's burning and it's not being consumed. You'll also be protected. Just basically for a Muslim Seder. Both say, this is called a Torah Kula. And the Koch Vyar says a line, he says, Ki koach atzir mo'ola ma'od Musa. Koach atzir is a very powerful, powerful um, tool in the area of Musa, in the area of driving home things and making them real. So I would just add one of the most powerful tools for Koach Hatzir is life and life's experience. The things we go through in life are both sides, whether it's things we've gone through or the things others have gone through, the things we go through in life and the experiences we have in life. If it were Chochamein of Barosho, who was smart and we look around and we understand and we, and we absorb it and think about it, and we appreciate it, there's no end to the lessons you can learn. And one thing I can say with absolute surety, this is a very unusual situation we're all in, a very terrible and unusual situation we're all in. We are experiencing something that certainly none of us have ever experienced. I don't know if no one in the history of the world has ever experienced. There have been other magefas in the history of the world. But to be living under these circumstances, under these conditions, and not use it as a koach hatzir, as to paint pictures for ourselves on the reality of things that we see in Das Torah. Now, you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, well, what do you mean, Rabbi? Can you give me some examples? I could, and Be'ez Hashem, I will, but all of my examples have one major flaw. They're my examples. They're things that struck me, and that's fine for me. And maybe you'll have a from the things that struck me. Maybe you won't but make sure something strikes you. Make sure you take lessons from this, whether it's right now, whether it's put it, in the, put it in the back of your head, put it in the back of your head, remember these experiences, remember these experiences. And when these things come up in Das Torah and you see something in the Torah about this, you'll understand, you know, what this is talking about. I'll give you just for myself, three examples that just come to my mind. Grada, not even all Pesach related. <laughs> let's, go through the, let's go through different Yamim Tovim. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Rabosa, we all say this in the Sana Tokef. Mi Barash, or Mi Magefa. And I'm sure I'm not the first one to make this step. I'm sure none of my steps, Rabosa, when, when 7 billion people in the world are experiencing something, everyone's going to think of something. I'm not claiming to say I'm just trying to bring out the concept of how you have to look around in the world around you and use these things as a koach hatzir. We say, mi ba Who dies in a magefa? It's like nuts. Who thinks about that? I had a similar one. It was a terrible, terrible tragedy. I remember a few years back, there was a little baby in the Catskills that was killed by a bear. Mother, you know, unfortunately, the child was, you know, who doesn't leave a baby out in, in, in a stroller in the Catskills? What's the problem? And the child was attacked by a bear. And I remember one of my first thoughts was, wow, mi Who's going to be killed by a wild animal? Who gets killed by a wild animal? It's nuts. Who gets killed in a magefa? Both sides, you can't even speak about it right now today. It's so painful. The God should be Israel. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to even talk about it. And it happened. We're watching. We're experiencing it. It's, 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 it's mind-boggling. And, and, and this is what we say in the Sana Token. These things were all judged and decreed on Rosh Hashanah. This whole year was decreed on Rosh Hashanah. You know what's going to happen, if nothing else? Next Rosh Hashanah is going to be a very different Rosh Hashanah. If we're a thinking person, certainly should be. Certainly should be. i say Tisha B'Av. My Tisha B'Av. We always talk on Tisha B'Av about the tremendous tsar and the tremendous pain of Tisha B'av in the distancing of Klal Yisrael from HaKadosh Baruch Hu with the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. I mean, I've heard that. I've heard that since I'm a little kid. We all know that. We're all familiar with that concept. 
There's a tremendous distancing. The closeness that we had, I think Chazal used a Lushen, there's like an iron curtain between us and a Kaddish Baruch Hu. I guess so. I assume so. I don't know, because I'll say so. I never really had a Beis HaMikdash. I, I'm supposed to be longing for the Beis HaMikdash. I'm supposed to want the Beis HaMikdash and want that connection, but it's hard. It's not something that's very real to us. Imagine if every shul in Kalal Yisrael were closed down. What are you talking about? That's crazy. That could never happen. You wouldn't even, if I had told you last week, every shul in Kalal Yisrael is going to be closed down two weeks ago. Like, what do you, why, Rabbi, is it going to be a pogrom? Expecting another crystal knock? What do you, what do you, how's that happening? How are you figuring that to happen? Oh, I don't know. Let's say it does. Well, how would you feel? Imagine the distancing, the pain. We can't dabble a minion, can't say Kaddish, can't lane. It's, it's, it's painful. It should be painful to people. And it's like, to me, it was very eye-opening. What? Could you imagine what the door that lost the base of Midrash must have felt like? They were seeing open miracles. And they lost that, the Karbonos, the Kapara. That's Chazal say. They were crying. They lost the opportunity. The Chapra al The altar, I believe it's the altar, who says, at the end of Dayenu, Kama, Kula, Kama, Tolus, Kulos, Mukhopelos, Lamakam, Aleinu. And we chazer over all of the good, all of the wonderful things that we said in Dayenu. And what, what's the punchline? Uvan Melano has base Habachira, the Chapra al Kapara Savonus, suppose that it's the ultimate chesed Hashem, Kapara Savonus. And they lost that. They lost that connection. Can you imagine how painful that was? It's the pain we're going through now is probably one one thousand. And the pain we're going through is awesome. It's so painful to see such a Midas Adin. Every yeshiva and shul and klai yisrael should close down. It's, 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 it's hard to wrap our brains around such a thing. It's hard to imagine such a Midas Adin. But that's, that's the destruction. That's a destruction. That's a different Tisha B'Av. And our both say, Pesach. I had to volunteer to somebody. Just simple step. Simple step in the Pesach story. Can you appreciate how this man, Moshe Rabbeinu, he comes to Mitzrayim. He comes to Paro. Shlach Esami Ve'avduni. Let my people go. He represents the Kaddish Baruch Hu, And in one moment, the whole world is turned over. In one moment, that's it. Starts these makos, 86 years of harsh, cruel, vicious concentration camp level labor is ended. And now Klai Yisrael is free. Like, like, what are you talking about? It's like nuts. For both sides. I think most of us, and again, maybe I'm speaking for myself, I can barely remember life before COVID-19. What was it like when it was normal? Here's a simple one. I've seen enough memes on this joke that I dare say you're all gonna agree with me, right? Uh, I just got one this morning. I, I won't bother trying to look it up, so I'll give you the exact, I'll tell you the, the simpler version of the one I got. Yeah, the simpler version was, there's no longer seven days in the week. We only have three days now. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Right? That's, that's the basic gag that's been floating around. Someone had, someone sent me a different one. The seven days of the week are this day, the other day, someday, you know, some, some gag like that. Again, Rebosa, if I'd have told you four weeks ago, something's going to happen to mankind, you'll have difficulty, you'll be struggling to remember the days of the week. What would you have told me? What are you talking about, Rabbi? Some kind of mass insanity? You told me, like, like some, I don't know, we're going to take a drug of some sort? I don't know. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. That we're all going to have to struggle. Day. How would that be? Why would that be? I have no idea. Well, the nice, we're living it. We're experiencing it right now. We're experiencing that exact hargasha, that sense of like, we don't know what's going on anymore. That sense of a whole new world. That sense of, I dare say, Yeshua Hashem Geher of Ayin, although it's in the reverse. And, but the Midah Tov is Marupa. I will say, and I don't feel like this happened too gradually. As some would say, well, it's not true. It started in China, and then it came over here. I will say, I feel like our lives just on a, on a dime got shut down. It's over. And the Midah Tov is moving. Both say, think about Yosef HaTzadik for a second. Think about Yosef HaTzadik, in the classic of Yeshua Hashem Geheravayim. Yosef HaTzadik, he is in the lowest of the lowest dregs of Mitri society. He's a prisoner in the Sarah Tabachim's prison. And he woke, wakes up one fine morning after 12 years that he's in jail, forgotten, a slave, 
a sold off convict criminal slave. And you tell him, you should know, Yosef, by the end of today, you're going to be the most second powerful man in Mitzrayim. Right, sure, if you say so. By Yeritzuhum in Abarim. Because I'll say, they, they, they ran him out of the bar. When, it was, when, when the time came, it wasn't enough that he was walking out of the bar. He was rushing. Get him to power right away. Get him to power right away. And in literally one moment, Yosef's entire life was turned upside down. Sorry, boss. In one moment, Yosef's entire life was turned upside down. And this, these, are, these, are, these are real events. This took place. We just got to inherit it. We got to think about it. We got to focus on it. We got to drive it home. And when you're living in something like that, you look around and say, wow, the whole world order could be turned over. I have tremendous aspirations. But one little simple thing in the news just struck me. Just struck me in the news when. Uh, as Pre Prime Minister Modi, or President Modi, I don't know exactly what his title is, Mahatma Modi, I don't know, the leader of India. The leader of India, with one stroke of his pen, announced that 1.3 billion people are going to be sheltered. Well, so 1.3 billion people is like a sixth of the world's population, fifth of the world's population. It's, a true, it's unbelievable. And in one, look, it's front page news, in one stroke of his pen, a sixth of the world population is locked up. That's it. It's, it's mind-boggling. It's, it's unbelievable. How does that happen? It's just like that. 21 days, no one's going outside. Who could predict such things? Now, of course, what do you mean? There's an explanation. Well, there's a virus, or this, or that. They're trying to social distancing, trying to make sense. Both sides, you can take anything in life and ignore it. Or you can take anything in life and learn lessons from it. The Rabbi Jaspin's father, Mr. Stanley Jaspin, He's a lawyer, a very prominent and important lawyer. Oh, he told me once, maybe his son told me, he argued a case for the Supreme Court of the United States. Wow. I'm not going to lie to you. That's one of the coolest things I've ever heard. This man argued before the Supreme Court of the United States. I will tell you, I dive in the better Shemona Esrei. I say for the rest of my life, but I hop to his spilus, and I dive in the better Shemona Esrei after that, for a little while after that. Why? Very simple. We've all heard the marshal. We've all heard the marshal. Ooh, you're standing before a king. Do I know from kings? What do I know from a king? I never stood before a king. I never met a king. I don't have a king. What's a king? Okay, yeah, it's true. It's so distant. But then I'm thinking, so Paul. This guy argued before the Supreme Court. I know what the Supreme Court is. I know who those men are. I read about them in the newspaper all the time. These are important people. And you know what happens? When you argue before the Supreme Court of the United States, you prepare and you're focused and you're thinking about what you're saying. And let me ask you, who's more important? Who's more important? The Supreme Court or God Almighty? It's obvious. But the, what's the, the godless of the Supreme Court is, it's a real seer to me. Now that's not even something I experienced. It's interesting, there's a Chazal that says, I believe, I don't think it's in Baha'u'llah, I think it's in Parashas Kiseite on, 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 the, on the mitzvah of Zuhar, what happens Miriam. I, I, don't, I don't have the Chazal in front of me, I'm saying it from memory. There's a Chazal that says that um, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu davened for Miriam with a, a unique and a very high level of tefillah, like a real pain in his tefillah. It's not if Chazal asked, or the people ask, like, Vos Ebbis says, Ah, Tfilo. There's a marshal of Ma'adar Domra to one Gibor that sees another Gibor locked up in chains. And he says, I remember when I was in prison. And I remember when I had those chains. And I feel his pain. And I, feel, and I remember that pain. So, so what's, what's the nimshol? Moshe Rabbeinu said, I also had Saras. And I remember what it was like to have Saras. So his tefillah for Miriam was so much greater. Vosai, yeah, Bar Hashem does come back to the Pesach story. When did Moshe Rabbeinu have tzaras? So we remember the story. At the Sneh, he spoke, Yishtikol, Lashon, and Haran, Chalai, so Heim, Lo, Yamin, Uli. So one of the osas, one of the signs was, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, put your, you know, hand in your garment, right. you pull it out, Arabian Torah, Kishel. And then he put it back in, and he was here. If we went? So no, Moshe Rabbeinu had a tzaras for, I don't know, 
30 seconds, five minutes, One 10 minute. minutes. How long was it? Yeah, how long did it? How long did he remain a Mitzorah? It's not much, but it was a whole day. Not a particularly long time, but he was a Mitzorah. And on both sides, it had happened, I guess, at least two years before. Two years before the mice with Miriam was the mice with Moshe Rabbeinu. And let's say he wouldn't have had that 10 minutes of Tsaras. Let's say he wouldn't have had that five minutes of Tsaras. He wouldn't dumb for his sister. He wouldn't be sympathetic to her pain. He wouldn't appreciate her pain. Of course he would have. But Lamai said there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. When I went through it myself, when I experienced something, something is real to me, that's a very different feeling. Even for Moshe Rabbeinu, even davening for Miriam, it makes a difference. It has an impact. People ask, why is that tefillah? made such a difference in the tefillah. And they're both saying, in this circumstance, we have to have both. I heard something else, just a pachad to me. Just a pachad. It was a rub in Silver Spring, who apparently was in the hospital, and Baruch Hashem, he was Zoha, he got out of the hospital, and he spoke to the community. I didn't even hear him speak. A friend of mine told me, one of the serum that he had, like one of the points he made was one of the hardest parts of it was, in the hospital, he was completely and entirely and utterly alone. No guests, no visitors, no family, and even doctors and nurses. But Rabbi said, I'm saying it over, the, the rabbi said that even when the doctors and nurses came in, they were like, they were like glassy eyed. They were like, they were, they, they were so shell shocked and overworked and tired from everything that's going on that they, they just, you know, you, you, you couldn't get any sympathy from them. They looked over, they did what you had to do it, and they moved on. Just, we'll say, Rabbi Akiva visits his Talmud, cleans up after me, says, Rabbi, you saw me, you gave me life. The person's alone in a hospital. And Baruch Hashem, we're not experiencing that. There should be a tremendous Rupur Shlame for anyone who unfortunately has to experience such a tzar. But again, it's just something to focus on. Just think about it. Make that real. And again, I don't know exactly, you know, when, where, and how each one of us can use these, these tziurim. Again, the fact that the whole world is turned over on its ear to me is a tremendous tzir. And don't get me wrong, about that. I'm not sitting here predicting Mashiach is coming. I don't know. I mean, yes, I take it back. Mashiach is coming. And he's coming very soon. Mashiach is at Tzal told me. Achak lo b'chol yom shiyavo. Even that, Rabbi Osai. Achak lo b'chol yom shiyavo. Just stop and think for a second about how Mashiach will turn over the world that we know. Just reflect on it. And again, Rabbi Osai, let me just give, give a little preface. The Chavetz Chaim, that was told in the Shem of the Chavetz Chaim, and I... And even if the Chavetz Chaim didn't say it, so I'll say it. It's not a wise thing to make Mashiach predictions. Oh, he's coming next week. He's coming tomorrow. He's this, he's that. Because Lamaisa, Lamaisa, it doesn't happen. And people get disappointed. No, Shabzai Tzvi set Chalaisa back quite a few centuries. So I'm not making such claims and such predictions. But just let's think about it and understand what's going on. Can you imagine a world where the entire world recognizes a Kaddish Baruch Hu? A billion Christians and a billion Muslims are all going to get up and say, oh, yeah, we were wrong. The 15 million Jews, they had the right religion. Oh, and a billion Hindus, by the way. The whole holy cow thing, forget it. Billions and billions of people in the world are going to all point to Claudius and say, yeah, you got it right. If you don't believe that's going to happen, you're not Bikaius. If you don't believe that could happen today, you're not Bikaius. Someone was telling me, some whole Khejbin about why Mashiach is coming this Thursday, telling me the Shabbos HaGadol. You'll see it's the same as, as Yetzirah Mitzrayim. I said, it's not true. Why do we have to wait till Thursday? Come tomorrow. What's Thursday? Why do we have to wait five days? It could come tomorrow. I once heard that story in the name of Moshe Feinstein that they found in Eretz Yisrael a perfectly red cow. A little calf was born that was 100% red. Every single hair on its body was red. And they give some people in the spa, right? that's Mashiach's coming. And they mentioned to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, he said, nonsense. He said, the paradum is not kosher until it's two years old. That's be a par, not an eagle. And it doesn't go out of a din eagle until it's two years old. So he says, so this thing is, we have to, so Mashiach will come tomorrow. We're going to have to wait two years to become tar. But stomach, there's another paradum in the world, we just don't know where it is. That was a Moshe. That's how he appreciated it. It's, it's, it's immediate. It's imminent. We have to believe it's imminent. I'll tell you a bigger Chiddush of Mashiach. Can you imagine all of Klai Yisrael 
having one leader? <laughs> Hard to imagine. Every Jew, Ashkenazi, Svardi, you know, Misnagid, Hasidish, uh, modern, uh, yeshivish, you name it. Every single Jew in Klai Yisrael is going to recognize one. I'm not sure which is the bigger Chiddush. A billion Muslims and a billion Christians and a billion Hindus giving up on their religion? Or every single Jew in Klai Yisrael recognizing one leader? I, I can't even imagine what he's going to look like. It's hard to fathom. These are all things that are very hard to, hard to grasp. But you know what? We've seen the world get turned over in ways that we couldn't imagine. In ways that, and Rahman al-Islam, it shouldn't get turned over any worse. Okay, it should be turned over for the good. Shnor Rabosai, after every tefillah, you should think to yourself, maybe the next tefillah, Dama Minyan. Shachris today wasn't with Minyan, but if, for all we know, Yeshua's Hashem carifying it. Every one of us can be Dama Minyan with a Minyan today. It's possible. Bez Hashem, Vashem wants, we can be Dama Minyan today. You have to believe that. You have to be a Maimon. Achakalo b'chol yom sheyavo. Every single day Mashiach can come. The people in Auschwitz were mechayiv to believe that. Mashiach, come. Look around. How could it be? The world could be turned over. It's possible. And again, Rabbi Osei, I'm not, not making any bold predictions, but just the hair. You see things in the world. Say, give me, let me give you a silly one. Let me give you a silly one. Chazal say, this is on top of Mashiach. Chazal say, just for the tzir, Shabbat, paint pictures for yourself. Nothing to do with COVID-19. Chazal say, Lo'olam, you should run to see the covet of kings. Because when you see the covet of a king, you'll appreciate someday what will be the covet of Mashiach. I've said this to you numerous times. During the Obama administration, the first lady of the United States was visiting with her husband the Windsor Castle, visiting or Buckingham Palace, I suppose, and visiting the Queen of England. And the first lady hugged the queen. That's very common. Two women meet each other and they hug. This was international news. It's international news that Mrs. Obama should hug the queen. But you don't put your hands on the body of the queen. That's considered disrespectful. So they had to root him. The queen leaned in first. So it was like she gave permission. That makes it okay. Okay, no. But it's in, who cares? Who cares about such things? It's internet. It's a faux pas. It's not how you treat a queen. That's not what a king is. That's not what a queen is. Again, we're both saying, it's just, the, the problem with Koach Etzir is, it's endless. That's the beauty of it when, you, when you're using it, and the problem of it when you're talking about it. Because I could sit here all day. There's every aspect of Yiddishkeit, every, everything you could possibly do. I've said this numerous times, that, you know, we all wonder, go back to Rosh Hashanah, Aser Simei we all wonder about, Hakel HaKadosh and HaMelech HaKadosh. Is it such a big deal? It's just one word. And I've said over numerous times how in 1992, strike that, 1988. In 1988, when Dan Quayle was running for vice president of the United States, in his speech, he mentioned Pearl Harbor Day, September 7th, 1941. Not one word of the speech was reported on, except that he said September instead of December, right? That was it. it was, he's a laughing stock. That's a dumb mistake. The guy's giving 10 speeches a day on no sleep. He's a, obviously a very successful politician. You know, he's, he, you don't get to run for vice president of the United States from nothing. But Lamaisa, that's what was mentioned. That's, that's what was talked about. Now, I'll ask you, if Dan Quayle would have been given the opportunity to re-give the whole speech, we're going to miss Senator Quayle? We're going to block that speech out like it never happened, and you'll be able to re-give the whole speech and replace that one word. What do you think would have happened? He'd have been dancing for joy. You know what, Obosai? When you say a Kela Kadosh instead of a Melech Kadosh, and you get to Davin again, that's a Chesed Hashem. Get a do-over. You don't worry. You messed up. That one word messed up the whole speech. You ruined it. I'm sitting here on the key saying Malchus, and you don't refer to me as a king? And you don't refer to me as a king? You messed up the whole speech. But as a chesed, I'll let you do it again. You can make that speech again. Rabbi said, when we dab Neshmon Esrei, we shouldn't be groaning. We should be dancing for joy at the opportunity. 
but you got to make it real. You got to drive it home. You got to think about it. You know how many times I've told the guys what it means to be a Bentora, right? What makes Pompeo, right? Mike Pompeo? What makes Mike Pompeo such an important person? Secretary of State of the United States of America. Why is he important? Why is everything he says international news? Well, because he's the chief diplomat who represents the president of the United States and 330 million people in the United States. He is the ambassador of the most powerful country in the world. That makes him an important person. Good. You're a Ben Torah. You're a Ben Yisrael. You're an ambassador in this world of God Almighty. Now, who's more important? You or the Secretary of State of the United States? Yeah, he represents president. He represents 330 million people. You represent the Kaddish Baruch, the world of Yatsmo. Now, I ask you, who's more important? It's Pashi. You got to focus on it. You're more important. What you represent is infinitely more important. We're both like, there's, there's no shortage. You just have to live life. And we're both like, this particular, and it's, and it's up to each individual. Every person has to find their own. One more step, Rabosai, about, in general, our approach, I think, to this whole terrible, terrible machala. Every one of us should be taking this at the most personal level possible. Because the reality is, it's hitting every one of us at the most personal level possible. Right? I was just reading the paper yesterday. There are people who are making a lot of money based on what's going on. Right? If you're in the grocery business, you're doing okay for yourself right now. Right? You're hiring extra workers. They're clearing out those shelves. Somebody's making money on all that toilet paper. Right? They're making a lot of money on it. Other people are literally starving. Literally. People in rural Texas who have people in rural Texas who have lost their day jobs, day laborers, workers, are literally making choices between, you know, am I going to use my money for rent and medicine or am I going to use it for food? They're literally going hungry. And there's an infinite number of reactions. You have people who are locked up with their family that they love, people who are locked up with their family that they hate, people who are locked up all by themselves and thrilled, people who are locked up all by themselves and are going out of their minds and depressed. Everybody is in a different circumstance, in a different experience, and we're all experiencing it uniquely and differently, which means we have to understand what this means to each of us as an individual. And Rabo said, there's only one source in my mind which could possibly make up for the loss of Torah and Tefillah and all of the tremendous, tremendous sorrow that we have now. It's only one source, and I think it's tshuva. The person is tshuva. The person has to ask himself, why is this happening to me? How is this happening to me? In what way is this happening to me? And again, I'm not saying we're going to each get a, the right answer necessarily, and we do look for others to, for guidance but we're each experiencing this in our own way. And that means our tshuva should be different. Our response should be different. Each of us, in, I've said this many, many times, we don't live in a world of, we don't live in a world of 7 billion people. We live in a world of 7 billion worlds with one person each. Each of us is our own world, b'shvili never ha'olam, Everyone's a savsa according to the, to, to the, that's actually funny, to go, going back to Pesach. Shiva Zatzal used to quote this all the time. One of the classic shmuzin or messages of the whole yantif from the altar is Hashgacha Pratis. A Jew and a Mitzri are drinking the exact same glass of water. For him, it's blood. For him, it's water. The sun rises today. For the Jew, it shines. For the Mitzri, it's Choshech. Now, you don't get the sun today. You know, what that, you know what the Alta learns from there? The sun's not rising for everybody. The sun is rising for each of us. The sun rose for me today. You know why? Because I'm not a Mitzri in Makas Choshech, and therefore I have light today. If I'd be a Mitzri in Makas Choshech, the sun wouldn't rise for me today. Each and every one of us is an individual. We have to look to do tshuva for ourselves in whatever way is, we think is correct. We often know ourselves. What do we have to work on? What message, so to speak. You know, I'm not looking for omens or both sides. But one concept that Marsha speaks of Midah connected Midah as being a good starting point, maybe, for understanding. 
or even if it's not from the particular tzara, we all know the basic things we have to work on. But each of us has to take this as an individual on a very individualized level. And the Mela, the tshuva we do as individual, the impact it has on us is individualized. And most importantly, the Nogea Dishmuz, the lessons we learn from it are individualized. The experience, the Bosite, you're experiencing something that Rabbi Harris quoted his 97 year old mother, Zanaya Zach. In 97 years on this world, she never saw such a thing. I'm not claiming never in world history, but certainly never in our lifetimes. And we'll remember it, and we'll use it, and we'll work on it. And I will say there's many things like this. I still remember when the anthrax scare was going around. People were afraid to eat powdered donuts. It was a drop in sales. You could laugh about it. But people were afraid. Anthrax was a white powder. People didn't want to eat powdered donuts. And I will say we all heard that scene when we were little kids. Ooh, don't eat the tarfus. Imagine if there was poison in there. And then you realize they're Michigan really doing it. They're not kidding around. They're really worried about the anthrax and the powdered donuts. It made it much more real. These people aren't kidding around. You know, the, the mock, I mean, there's no shortage of people who've connected the whole COVID-19 to the Magaifos, the Makas Mitzrayim. I don't know, I guess Dever. It was a Dever Mitzrayim, hit the sheep, Makas Bechoros. But these things are real. These things are happening. They're around us. We just have to experience, and we'll experience on a personal level. What is it like to be cooped up? That's a, it's a thing. You don't know what day of the week it is. Talk about, it's how you used to struggle to remember the day of the week. All the days run together. It's a chiddushtik experience. It's a chiddushtik feeling. Whatever we get from this, whatever we experience in this, use it now. Use it for Pesach. Use it for Sukkot. Use it for Shavuos. Use it for every Yontif. Use it for everything for the rest of your life. Put, it in, put, it, put that experience, put it in the mental attic, put it in the mental storage house, remember it, tap into it. I, say, I dare say, that's why older people have so much more chachma. It's because I'll say, Kamar Fatki. They saw miracles in their life. She was actually used to quote all the time. That Rabbi Yochri stood up for an old guy. Why? Kamar Fatki Adolai. He saw much experience, many miracles, much life. Experience. But she asked, how does he know? Maybe the guy was in, just had a simple, plain old life that wasn't particularly noteworthy because there's no such thing. Anyone who's in this world for a significant amount of time reaches old age, he's having life's experiences. He's seeing miracles. He's seeing things. It's just up to us to be a chacham and use those experiences properly, tap into them. And everyone is an individual and use other people's experiences. I don't have any great experiences. I don't know, Rabbi, nothing strikes me. So talk to other people, read things that people write, see, but uh, use the experience of Bosai. Use it, drive it home, make color total cooler real. And again, the malacha of the Seder, make it see as Mitzrayim real. I have to feel like I went out of Mitzrayim. I went out of Mitzrayim? Well, I don't know, am I wearing a turban? <laughs> what, do I, what does that mean? I went out of Mitzrayim. Picture of Bosai. Picture, make it real for you. I still remember. It's such an impact on me. The first time I heard the Rashi was at Saul, referred to Mitzrayim with Auschwitz. So was he talking to Auschwitz? Because I guess I always thought of it as like, yeah, I don't know, the, 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 the blacks were enslaved in the South by the whites. Terrible thing. It was talking terrible. They weren't throwing black babies in the river. They weren't slaughtering black babies and bathing in their blood. That's a lot more like a concentration camp than it is. You read the Midrashim, and again, you the hair. Can you picture it, Mose? Picture the Jewish mother whose baby is ripped out of her hands and cemented into a wall. The baby was probably shrieking. And as you put the cement up on the wall, the baby's cries got weaker and weaker and weaker until eventually they stopped and there were no cries at all. And the baby just died in the wall. Picture that Jewish mother standing there watching that happen. Picture the Jewish mother who's watching her baby sink in the river. It's Leumi Ki Super to imagine such a thing. The only stories we've heard like that are, are, are Auschwitz related. It's Ayim Venora. And then just like that, we're free. Lakachas Logoy, Miker of Goy. Just so Grumblat mentioned. There's no such thing as Lakachas Logoy, Miker of Goy. That's not where nations come from. Nations don't come out of other nations. It's nonsense. Where does a nation come from? An indigenous group of people are living in an area and they become a nation. We're the only ones in world history, Rabosai. Our very existence is miraculous. 
the way to, to remove one people from another to make a nation never happened before and will never happen again in the history of the world. You got to know a little history to understand that. You have to open your eyes. You have to see what's going on around you. Did you ever see such a thing? Never happened before. That's, that's Mitzrayim. You see, it's Mitzrayim. He made us for a people. He gave us our cheros. We are an individual free people. We will stand as Klal Yisrael to the end of time. Again, you just have to make it real. You have to work on it. You have to think about it. And you have to paint pictures for yourself. Paint yourself pictures that make it real. I dare say, Rebosai, it's, it's the Malach of the Seder. It's the Malach of Pesach. It's the Malach of every Yantif. It's the Malach of Kala Torah Kula. That is what Hashem wants from us. To take the things we know. There's no chidushim. No major chidushim in these things. But you drive them home. You make them real. One more final. Just the Chavitz Chaim. I think was, you know, an unbelievable. The Shiva referred to it. I never heard it from his mouth. Radner Musser. Almost like a separate, a separate Mahalach and Musser. They referred to it as Radner Musser. You read the Sipri Chavitz Chaim. The Koach Atzir that he paints. The pictures he, he paints, the way he lived his life. I mean, I say the story many, many times of the traveler who came through Radin and, and uh, he asked the Chavetz Chaim, he says, where's your furniture? Where's your furniture? And he said, uh, where's your furniture? And the guy started laughing. He goes, I'm just traveling through Radin. I don't live here. I have my furniture in my house. Chavetz says, I'm also just traveling through Radin. I'm also in this world for a show. I'm just a traveler through this world. I both say, how real is that to the Chavetz Chaim? How real is it to him that he doesn't have furniture because I'm just traveling in this world? Real. Make it real. And our Bosai Be'ez Hashem, if we'll do this again, it's the malach of Kolotor Kula. We drive these things home and we use other people's experiences and other people's theory. We read the Sifrei Chavetz Chaim, we read the Sifrei Musr, Yechazer, remind yourself and you review and you paint mental pictures. You paint pictures that make these things real. And Be'ez Hashem, I think of will be, will be different Jews. And make it all call it Torah Kula will be different. Yeah, again, the Seder is different, Pesach is different, Yom Tov are different, call it Torah Kula is different because we take these things we know, we drive them home on an emotional level, it really truly becomes part of us. And Bez Hashem, we come close to close to Kaddish Baruch Hu, and we should see Bez Hashem Bosa in that schus of this chuva and of making it real and getting close to Kaddish Baruch Hu, we'll see a true Gaula Shlaim of Meir of Yamenu, the Bez Hashem. A geula from this terrible tzara and a geula from Heir Yamenu to all of Klai so to come in Mashiach. Shkai from us. Thank you, Rebbe. Thank you, Rebbe.